Hello and welcome to the Overy Jones Show. I'm your host, Melanie Holscher, survivor and author of Becoming Overy Jones. And if you too heard those words, you've got cancer, this is the place to be. I am so excited to introduce you to a guy with amazing insight through his cancer journey. His name is Larry Indiviglia. Larry, welcome to the Overy Jones Show. Thank you, Melanie. It is such a pleasure and honor to be here. And um, I just am just um, really happy that we connected and that we're going to offer some value today in our conversation. So I can't wait to, to get started with you. Absolutely. So you actually did hear those words, you've got cancer. What was that like for you? And did you make any lifestyle or mindfulness changes after you heard those words? Tell me, tell me a little bit about that. It was a shock. It was back in October uh, on my 60th birthday uh, year, back a couple couple months after my 60th birthday, I um, got a routine colonoscopy and uh, one of the polyps came up malignant and um, I was very surprised I was asymptomatic, but um, once something like that happens, um, you know, the medical people start really going crazy and they want to make sure, you know, everything is checked out, blood work, imagery, everything else. And um, it wasn't a huge polyp. I felt good after um, getting the diagnosis. The, um, the uh, doctor who did the procedure was very shocked and surprised. She said, I've never seen something cancerous that was this small. Um, but yet you get that word, okay, and then there is some concern. And then you say to yourself, okay, well, has the lab done the pathology right? You know, you want to make sure everything has been done right. You do some double checking. Um, and then after imagery and blood work and everything else, and to make a long story short, there was nothing else indicating a huge presence of cancer in my rectum. It was a rectal cancer based on a colonoscopy. So um, I, I, I went out and got a second opinion, um, which was, hey, we'll go in and do more advanced biopsy and um, a procedure to make sure that there isn't anything there. And then if there's nothing there, great. And there's no further treatment. And I really didn't necessarily want to do that. So I actually went out and consulted a couple of different types of medicine, Chinese herbal medicine, macrobiotic people. It took me about five weeks to come to some clarity as to whether I wanted to have the surgery. I did, it wasn't pleasant. Um, and then two weeks after the surgery, uh, they found out, thankfully, there was no other cancer found in the area, okay? Mm-hmm. But you're on pins and needles, and that was, that was what I had to do. That was the nature of, of my treatment, if you will. And then from there, though, to answer the question to Melody, part two was I went on a plant-based diet for the next three years and, um, and, and really made changes to nutrition, to my lifestyle, worked less, try to get sleep more, try to reduce stress. And the plant-based diet and, and some supplementation um, that, that I chose to take, um, enzymes and some other things um, is what I did. And then I had the five years after that, a colonoscopy every year. Thankfully, I've got past the fifth year. It's been six years now since October, 2015. And uh, I've been healthy. So. Um, that's, that's my story, and that's probably a mild story compared to many and certainly to yours. Well, but it's a story, and what I love about it is, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty, and, and you did what you needed to do, and thankfully, I'm very happy that, uh, you know, you've gotten past that five years and, and everything is good, but that's not the end of your experience with cancer, maybe not your personal battle, but you went on to um, have another journey with cancer. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it, it's, and thanks for asking, Melanie. Um, you know, in October 2015, I was diagnosed, let's say with stage zero to slash stage one rectal cancer, okay? Um, 200 miles up the coast, um, there was a woman in October 2015, her name was Gail, was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer, stage four, not stage zero or one. And that changed her life 
um, she was 64 years old at the time, um, immensely, because her treatment and her um, path and cancer journey uh, was far deeper than mine. However, I became a part of her cancer journey because in January 2020, um, we both decided that um, love was important in our lives and we both went on to an online um, dating site. And in January of uh, 2020, in fact, it was January 6th, we actually met online, connected, and, um, and uh, Gail and I hit it off um, on that first phone call. And she told me, you know, Larry, I just want you to know, um, I've been battling stage four breast cancer for four plus years. Uh, I've had a single mastectomy, so if that's gonna freak you out, let's put that on the table right now. Um, I'm still on limited chemo for my lung. I've had three surgeries, two on my neck, and it spread to my bones. My brain has been radiated, but I'm still able to talk to you today, so that's probably a good sign there's some brain cells still working. She did have a sense of humor about it, Melanie. Mm -hmm. And um, after that phone call, I was very captivated by her courage, um, her sense of humor, um, her forthrightness, her openness, her honesty, and... Um, her, her ability to be able to have that duality in her life, to be, to be in a battle with stage four cancer yet, yet making the choice not to live in its shadow and to go out there and, and, find, a, and, and find a relationship in her life, which she had been without for during the four years of her battle. Mm -hmm. uh, we met the next night. And uh, that um, was the start of 126 days, 11 minutes together. And uh, we were in our 60s. I was 64 at the time. Gail was 68. So we're not looking at puppy love here, Melanie. <laughs> Gail had been married three times. I had been divorced once. So it wasn't our first go around. But it was intentional that we wanted to find love and create love. And I do believe the universe and God connected us at that time for really an important purpose. Absolutely. And I will tell you that I really thought long and hard about this interview and whether to have it or not, because quite honestly, I typically do not put anything out there that has a sad ending. <laughs> I, throughout my journey, was very intentional about the people that I spoke to. Everybody meant well, but they would always tell me these stories and the stories didn't have happy endings. And, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't want to go there in my mind at that time. And so I thought long and hard about this interview. And the reason why I really am excited about meeting you and introducing you is because of the courage that, that Gail had. And uh, you actually wrote a book one, 126 days and 11 minutes, which is absolutely beautiful. And, um, you know, as I was reading this book, there was something that you said toward the beginning that was love comes to everyone who seeks it, is open to it, and says yes to it when it feels right. And I just thought that was so beautiful um, that that was a belief that both of you have and um, that you were able, she was able to go out and look for love in the spite, you know, no matter what else was going on in her life. And, and so I'm, I'm really excited to actually bring that story uh, to everybody today. Um, you know, Millie, I thank you for the kind words. And, you know, it was, it was Gail's journey and, and my, um, and both of our, both of our willingnesses, kind of plural in that word, that's a mouthful, willingnesses, our, our abilities to uh, follow our hearts and to take a risk. And, and, and let me just back up one thing because um, I, I think there's something here, you know, you talk about, you know, happy endings and positivity and you're all about that. And, um, but there's something here, it's interesting on our connection, Melanie, and, and in Becoming Overy Jones, your book, you talk about 
life prolonging takeaways. In fact, uh, it's on page, uh, this was very profound in, cha in chapter five. And uh, one of the life prolonging takeaways you, you recommend, what you look for, you will find. That is so funny that you say that because I literally wrote that in my notes. Like, I believe you find what you're looking for. <laughs> Seek out happiness. Gail, with all that she had been through, um, was seeking out happiness to help prolong her life. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I was seeking out happiness in a different way, perhaps not as I was not, I was not battling and having to deal with what she was battling, but we were both seeking out happiness and it was, it was very courageous for her and for you and your continuing story to do so. So there's the, there's the kind of connection we have there in 126 days and 11 minutes, our love story. Um, it, there is a lot of happiness in there. Okay. We, we had nine and a half, 10 weeks. And, you know, I, I think one person said on a review of the book, cancer be damned, we're going for it. And, and we, we had a great 10 weeks and as much joy and as much fun as we pot an adventure as we possibly could have also very cognizant of the fact that there was duality there was things that gales could do and she could not do she had certain energy on to do certain things some days not so much okay but we dealt with that and we created happiness and we created joy and uh, i i know i will never ever re regret those 10 weeks together um, I don't think Gail ever would if she was today. And then, you know, the, the, it took a different turn, okay, where it was, because the book is about life, maybe more than anything else. It's about love. It's about learning from each other. And, uh, and it's about looking for love and trying to create happiness, as you say. Yeah, absolutely. What I really enjoyed about it or was struck by it is um, – I actually dated a guy when I was in college that was a naval cadet at the academy where you're familiar with. <laughs> and uh, we used to send through snail mail, you know, poems to, to each other. And it really struck me as I was reading all the poetry that you and Gail exchanged between each other. I'm like, wow, she is having this amazing love affair in this stage of her life. And I haven't really experienced it that since college. So, you know, it just made me feel so happy to know that she was just boldly going after it at, you know, at her age. And she said something to you. She said, as much as I can, Larry, I want to reflect back to you your own light, the light that you are shining on me. And I just think it's so beautiful how a couple can really take on a personality of their own and really shine back and forth and, and grow this unique um, personality all of, all of its own, if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah. You know, Melanie, um, you know, everybody shines with the proper light shine upon he or she. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes um, it, it, uh, it, it takes each of us as, as people, whether it's a he, she, whatever side it happens to be, to recognize um, the real worth. And, you know, the word greatness is thrown around a lot, but, you know, the greatness that you see in another is really your greatness. The, the light you see in another is really your, your light, okay? And then certainly we all need you know, to, to feel good and to have people, you know, really tell us nice things about us, certainly if they're true. And we like to hear that, whether it's words of af affirmations or whether it's different actions we take or words through a poem. And uh, it could be a love letter. It's a phone call, it's a text. And uh, all of those that I had collected and also journaling were instrumental in being able to put that 
together in the book, 126 Days, 11 Minutes. I, I had that material and I had that purposeful communication that, that I had with Gail, who I call beautiful. And you know, you, you get that in the book. And then she calls me handsome. And, and those things yeah, are nice. 30. You know, those things are nice. And, um, and, and uh, when you're older, and we were and are, okay, um, you do have the ability to put those type of things in a better perspective. And I think if they were missing in your life, or maybe they were present at one time, you want to bring that practice back or you want to create it for the first time because you said, you know, I've, I've never done that. And this feels totally right. So, and as anything else, it takes two, doesn't it, Melanie? It takes two when it comes to relationship. Absolutely. And you guys, it's just the flirtation between you two. And, you know, she would call you handsome and my lion and all that good stuff. And, and then, you know, even getting a, um, finger wagging from a waitress when you guys were, you know, making out in a booth. <laughs> the kissing in that restaurant, that was funny. <laughs> I know, what are we too old? Um, you know, and it's, you, you know what though, Melanie, I, you understand and many of your listeners, whether it happens to be a cancer diagnosis or somebody who's really struggling and and I actually put that in the book uh, towards the end and the afterward. And I think you might remember. I said, you know, for all the Gales and Larrys out there, and it doesn't have to necessarily be a cancer situation, although it can be. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a life and death situation, although it can be. But if one person's struggling, you know, um, don't be afraid of that. Yeah. yeah. Society says avoid it. It's like, well, you're too old, so you can't be kissing in the restaurant. Well, why not? You know, to Gail, she had been through so much, like she's going to worry about a 21-year-old waitress saying, oh, you can't kiss here. You're supposed to be eating. You know, so again, there's perspective, and then there's a little bit of humor in it, in it too. So uh, have to be able to laugh. Absolutely. I thoroughly enjoyed that. I, I actually laughed out loud when I read that. So I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the flirtiness of it. And I enjoyed just, you know, being there, shining that light on one another and really bringing out the very best in, in one another, going through a storm. Because again, like you said, it doesn't matter if the storm has the name of cancer on it or not. We all go through uh, storms and, you know, we're either going into a storm, we're in a storm or we're coming out of a storm. So being able to be with somebody through their storms and still be able to laugh and flirt and, and have fun. And you guys went on all, all kinds of little weekend rendezvous, getaways yeah. at the beach. And, you know, it was, you know, you guys had a really fun relationship. And I know part of Gail's love in her life, and she was a very passionate woman, is dance. And you highlighted that a lot in, in 126 days and 11 minutes. So, uh, the role of dance and how did that kind of come into play? I know you guys never actually got to dance together. Yeah, if we did, there was some gyrations a few times. Not tango though. Da Gail was, um, you know, a lifelong photographer, 33 years. She did a lot of work. She had three photography books that she published. One of which, I might, I might add, uh, I'm not here to sell books, and I don't even think it's for sale anymore. But her last one called Barely Here. That was the name of the um, of the book and she, she named it barely here. Um, and you'll, you'll probably remember the passage. I won't give it away as far as where it's in the book, but, uh, that one was published, uh, two, two and a half, three years into her battle. She got that last book out, but lifelong photographer, but as a, as a, um, young woman, she was always a, a workout person, modern dance. She got into ballet She's a very strong woman. She had an incredible dancer's body and she worked out a lot and she loved to dance. In 20, I think it was 20, uh, 2008, right about that period of time, she learned the Argentinian tango and she was just captivated by it and took to it. She just loved it. And um, so her relationship with the tango dance became like, that became a manifestation of, 
of what a relationship should be. She felt a strong male lead where she could follow, but it's gotta be a purposeful, it's gotta be a loving, it's gotta be a respectful lead, not somebody just jerking you around on the dance floor. And the Argentinian tango is a very subtle uh, movement dance. And um, it, it's interesting, she felt that kept her alive. So when she was diagnosed and went through her four and a half years ultimately battle, she always, always stayed connected with tango went to the Saturday night dances when she could, there was some times where she couldn't, you know, during her intense treatment days, but she stayed in contact with it all the time. Even when she had lost all her hair and, you know, had to start over again. And she just always had a great connection with the tango community. And, and some of those people certainly throughout her life really took care of her emotionally, spiritually, physically, mentally, they had a real connection with her. So uh, tango was a kind of a microcosm of life in a way. You know, we talk about, you know, art imitating life, life imitating art. There was that deep connection. And the cover of the book is one of Gail's photos of a tango um, uh, malanga, which is a tango gathering, Argentinian tango gathering. It was one of her, she did a lot of black and white. It was one of her few color photos and uh, we used that for the cover of the book because it was the essence of what she was about and what that meant to her. And I talk about that a lot in, in the book. It's very, very inspiring. And um, at some point, I think I would have learned it with her. I probably would have had to, frankly. I mean, if, you know, but um, it just didn't go then that way. Yeah. Well, actually, I did jot down a little quote from that. She said, uh, at times, I would get discouraged thinking about the possible cure for cancer was an impossible quest. But with tango, not so. Anything is possible with tango. And I just thought that was, that's beautiful. You know, she found something in her art and in, in you know, dance is such a beautiful art form. And anything was possible with that. And I remember I took dance lessons years ago. And my instructor would always say, I do what you do. I'm a, I'm a business coach. And so sometimes we have, you know, the weight of the world on our shoulders. And I would go into the studio and he was like, you're so tense. And he would just say, you know, close your eyes. What city are we in? And I would, you know, name some random international city. And then we'd, he would put on music to match. And then he was like, okay, just close your eyes. That's where we are and we would just dance. And so the art of dance is just a beautiful thing to, I think, help somebody transcend any struggle in life. Uh, but it was certainly a, a big, huge part of, of Gail and who she was. Yeah, it was. And in particular too, and that's a great, um, that, that's a great analogy, a great story you just shared, Melanie, is um, Argentinian tango, I remember Gail invited me and I, I, I shared in the book to the one Malanga in San Diego. And, you know, she was really dressed up and she says, you know, I'm gonna be dancing with a lot of men. I said, oh, look, don't worry about it. You know, let's go, I, I wanna see it. I, I do wanna see what it's about. So I did go, I shared in the book and I, I thought it was very interesting. She, I was looking for patterns of dancing, the steps in the Argentinian tango. And the thing about it is there's a structure but not a structure so that you could kind of just, as you say, get absorbed into the music, right? And then you feel the music and then the movement kind of mimics and is measured, you know, with the music. It's a, it's a total integration uh, rather than some of the other dance steps like maybe a waltz or some of the traditional. This was a little bit more, I don't wanna, I don't wanna say freelance because I think Giorgettino Tango people listening to this would jump, jump through and say, wait a minute, but it is a subtlety and it's just beautiful. And uh, I remember, uh, you know, my, my dad was a famous artist and I really wish I would have had some of his artistic talent because I was looking at all the personalities, how the ladies were dressed, how the guys were dressed. It would have been just a great time to sit down there and sketch people, you know, for two or three hours, which, which I was there to watch it. It was very, very, it was in, in, uh, interesting and very inspiring to me. And she just had a great time that night. It was great. Yes, that's beautiful, beautiful. I want to mention one other quote, and that is, the risk you're afraid to take could be the one that changes your entire life. Sometimes you have to stop being scared and just go for it. And I just, 
thought that was such a beautiful sentiment to really think about, um, you know, what what is fear holding me back from? And I, I just would love for you to comment on that. Well, you know, society standards, um, I'm, I'm, uh, let's say the first phone call with Gail, or let's just go to the first meeting. Uh, I find out she has limited or no money. She has, she has a, a very huge health challenge. Some would say after somebody says stage four, she has limited time. She, she's fighting physical issues, you know, b- because of her chemo and other things. Um, at times she could have limited energy. Um, she's living in her mother's home. Um, all those things, people looking at it, one, two, three, four, five, six, society says, get up from the table, walk away. You know, this is not going to lead anywhere. To me, it was just the opposite, okay? Because I was captivated initially by her soul. She was a beautiful woman, um, Melanie. I did not put a picture of Gail or a picture of myself in the book because I wanted people to imagine, and I didn't want that to take away from the story, okay? It was a story of two people, irrespective of what they looked like. So me being handsome to Gail and she being beautiful to me, it, that didn't matter, okay? It's not by society standards, that was by our standards. Now, you know, humbly, I think we're two good looking people, that's fine, but that's not what I wanted to put on the book. So the point about risk and not risk, society could say, don't get involved with it. And then I say to myself, look at all I've learned and experienced from my relationship, brief relationship with Gail, and then and then look what she has gained, uh, which turned out to be her last days. Okay, even though let's be clear, when I sat down with her, that was not her attitude. Her attitude was she was beating this, and her goal was to get an oncologist and a holistic health practitioner to work together. Um, that they could innovatively maybe attack the cancer where she was at in a different way. Also through, um, I don't wanna say unorthodox, but let's say non-Western medicine treatments, okay? Um, did it happen? Um, she, she did go down that route in some cases when, when she stopped taking the chemo um, and when she didn't want to get radiated again. But um, make no mistake, taking that risk will provide an opportunity, whether it's a love relationship or it could actually be a a business type of thing, to find out something about yourself that you never would have experienced. I really believe that. Absolutely. And, you know, I think in many ways, you guys had really, yes, it was a whirlwind, whirlwind romance, obviously, but the deep connection that you had and she was able to experience because she was willing to put herself out there and and take those, those risks. She wasn't going to wait around. Um, You know, she was going to just keep on putting herself out there. I think that's incredible and amazing, but you two were able to come together and share something just so profound, so beautiful. And then, um, you know, you were able to serve her all the way to the very end, which I thought was so very beautiful. You know, she had a a love, um, you know, that that she was able to experience and she wouldn't have had she not put herself out there, you know. And the other thing is, you know, I thought, wow, what a great guy this Larry person is, you know, (laughs) as I was reading. I was like, what a great guy, you know, just there to the to the very end and just there to serve her and to and to help her. And I was thinking, you know, what a great guy you were. And then it dawned on me. I'm like, and then he writes the book about it. Like, (laughs) who gets involved in, you know, this relationship, which is, you know, could be argued as a little short, cut short. Um, But then you were actually, you know, you wrote a book about her. And I was just blown away by how much love that you had for her. And all of that, neither of you would have experienced if you didn't put yourselves out there and and go for it. So that's just incredible. I 
I, I appreciate the words that, um, you know, writing in the book, it was, um, when I wrote it, it took me six, six to seven weeks. I had an accountability partner, uh, Kelly, Kelly Watson, who wrote the beautiful forward to the book. Uh, I've known Kelly for many years. She has a, a publishing company that helps people write books, but she was, that was an accountability partner. COVID had hit, so I had more time to do it. And it was almost like this perfect storm. It's, it, it's um, you know, sometimes when you're in the emotional state, maybe you won't be quote objective enough and you'll be overcome by the emotion. But it was just the opposite for me. I felt I had this window. COVID provided me more time to focus and dedicate to it. And I said, you know, if I don't get it done in the six, seven weeks, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do it to the level that I want to. And, um, and, I, and I had to source material. And more, more of anything else was to get Gail's story out there because there's many Gails out there um, in, in battling a breast cancer specifically, or gals, the many gals out there struggling or suffering from other cancers. It doesn't have to be breast cancer. It could be the cancer that, that you know, you survived and, and battled, Melanie. So the point was every woman, and you know, I did want, wanted to put that hope in that when the cancer journey, there's always pain and fear but with, with, um, with hope, with faith and hope, that gives us the strength eventually to find peace. Peace in how you're going to continue to fight it. Peace in a choice that you will make and having clarity to do that. And, I, and Gail did make a powerful choice to continue to love in the shadow of cancer and, and, and continue to live. Okay, and, and these things are important and peace could be defined, peace of mind, a lot of different things, you know, when you're, when you're going through that. But um, I did want to make sure that people would get the ability to appreciate the courage that anybody who is battling cancer, what they're going through, um, also what they can do. And you know this, you're still a person you still can control things. You still can do things. And your book, Becoming Overy Jones, particularly brings that out, okay? And, and, and also, we only have a set number of days and times, you know, for my relationship with Gail, it was 126 days, 11 minutes. But during that particular time, great, great lessons learned. And then also, it's the story of life and a happy phase of life and then an ending phase of life but life in and of itself is beautiful and then you find out the people that you do meet on this journey and the roles they play and again being open to it such a key and, and in your words um melanie the mindset okay it comes in having that mindset that you can do a lot if you set your mind to it and as you quoted my uh, quote being open to find love. Yeah. Yeah. I just think it's, it's beautiful. And the story was, you know, just so real, just so raw. And you're so transparent. I mean, there are actual text messages, actual poems that you guys had ex exchanged. And I just found that to be very refreshing. It wasn't hiding behind any filters or, or anything like that. It was just, this is, this is our story. And it was beautiful. And what are some of the profound, lasting, life-altering, perhaps, uh, things that have come from your love with, with Gail? Well, in life, Melanie, it's, it's very rare. Um, and when you do find it and create it, you don't find it. You have to create it with another, as far as, at least in a man-woman relationship, you know, that I'm referring to at least, and maybe in other types of relationships, but I could at least speak to that because that's where, what I experienced. Um, emotional, mental, uh, spiritual, uh, physical alignment and connection. Uh, very, very important. I learned that with Gail. And, and when you're aligned in all four of those aspects of your life, 
it enhances the other aspects, okay? Um, if you have a great emotional connection, that will help your mental and physical connection, et cetera. Um, it's possible and it can be created. And I know many maybe of your listeners on the call have, um, have achieved that in their life and continuing to do that, great. If you had not, don't give up, there is hope and uh, you have to be willing I don't want to say to do the work. Uh, it sounds like you have to pack a lunch pail every day, and that's that's the that's the nature of the of the task. No, uh, it when when you meet a person that you align with and are captivated by, um, that those things will evolve. Those things will evolve, and then your sense of awareness will be heightened um, when you know that you're experiencing that and you want to continue to nourish that. Um, you know, following your heart's huge. Like I said, with no society, uh, don't, don't listen to society standards and their judgments and things. Uh, follow your heart and, and that, will, that, that will really lead to some unconditional love. Um, you know, what Gail always told me, um, she quoted that famous line from that song, Nature Boy, the greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return. Some of us are great at loving, but maybe not being willing to receive that love back mm -hmm. or receiving it all and not being willing to give. So a very powerful, very simple lyric, but ultimately defines what love is about and that you have to have the ability to, to do those um, two things. The, the ability and willingness to live in the today, in the present, and to enhance that. Um, maybe that's why I, I, I didn't have many, many days with Gales, but the, the way I wrote the book was by day, because that's the day we have. In fact, the team I coach, I, I, I coach health and fitness professionals in business and life. The name of our team is Team Today because it's what, what can we achieve and win today? Because yesterday's behind us, there's no guarantees to tomorrow. I don't wanna be a fatalist here, but if you focused on the today, and that's what we did, and, and I think that's, that's what I shared in the book, because each day turned out to be, was precious, and even though we weren't doing a run for your life type scenario, well, you know, my time is limited. Gail was not thinking that way. Ultimately, the time we had together was limited, but that wasn't a thought process. Um, the other thing is too, a final thing, um, Melanie, is unconditional love can be bestowed on each other, but you have to love yourself first unconditionally. And when you can do that, then you're more apt to be able to extend that to another person. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. And you know, so much, as a business coach, you, you understand this, but so much of the things that we ultimately do are a result of the deep-seated beliefs that we have that we might not even realize. Um, but you have a belief, and you, you too shared a belief, like I started the show with, that you know, love comes to everybody who's open to it. And that was just a, a belief that you both have. And I think that there are so many beliefs that we have, you know, what are you supposed to look like at, you know, 60 or 65 or 55, or, you know, what are you supposed to be able to do? What are you supposed to, all of these things are beliefs that we have deep seated in us. And we, it's our operating system. When we kind of make decisions based on those beliefs that are subconscious most of the time, and I think that really has a huge impact on how our life is manifested. So I just love that your operating system is a belief in love. And I think if there's one thing that I would love to share with my audience is that, you know, be open to that. And, and if that's not your belief, challenge your, the belief that you have now and uh, see you know, where you can go with expanding your belief in, in what's possible, even with cancer. Uh, absolutely, yeah. And, um, you know, 
belief, hope, you know, we, we faith. And, um, you know, these are words, you know, they're words matter. As, as you share in your book, Melanie, words do matter. Okay. And some of those things, whether you write them down, which is powerful and then, and then repeating them aloud, or maybe it's quiet time in the morning and, and you, know, whatever works for a person, as far as journaling, or it could be a, um, it could be a, a daily reading, um, you know, it could be a daily journaling technique, um, wh whatever, you know, it, it, it happens to be, um, what you, what you think about often and the quality of those thoughts, you know, definitely do make a difference. And, um, and, and, and I'm, I'm with you, I'm with you, it, especially when adversity hits, when adversity hits, um, very, very important, you know, to be able, um, to, to have those best practices, you know, and because they're going to help you. They're definitely going to help you. And as you share in your book too, it, it may save your life. It literally may save your life. And, um, or at least as in Gail's case, prolong your life because it did for her. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I talk about a fellow in my book that uh, was flying down the Audubon in a, in a Lamborghini six weeks after he was given four weeks to live. You know, so really, we all have an expiration date. It's the dash between the day that we were born and the day that, you know, we leave. It, that's That dash is what matters, right? There's the, the famous poem that talks about the dash. But, you know, really, um, you know, what I love about Gail is, you know, the juice was worth the squeeze. She, she lived every day of her life with intentionality. And I think if we can all learn to live more intentionally, more on purpose, and more willing and open to receive the the light, and you know to enjoy, even if we're battling any storm, you know life can be really good even through the storms. A hundred percent, I couldn't agree more. And um, and when you take when you take that mindset with you you know, it'll, it'll create opportunities for you in your ability to connect with others. And then also uh, to pay attention to things that, um, that will elevate or enhance your life. Or if it's somebody in a cancer situation where you're looking for ways uh, to get through treatments or to seek treatments that, that you believe, okay, may, may help you um that's super important you know in in believing um it's like if it's if it's not true in your mind um you know don't believe it you know it's got to be true in your mind and then if it's not right for you don't don't do it uh, okay but that's that comes from awareness and and uh being very pur purposeful in your thoughts and what you read and certainly the people you hang out with and, um, and the information that, that you take in. And um, I, I think we'd be remiss in not bringing this up. Gail had a, um, a different, uh, not a non-traditional view of God, okay? She, she definitely believed in a higher power, a higher level of transition, that there was life after our earthly journey. Absolutely for sure. Um, did scripture from the Bible, did an organized uh, monoistic religion work for her? No, it didn't. She did experiment with some of those during her 68 years. Um, and it was interesting during ha her hospice time, um, because of COVID, the spiritual counselors couldn't be at hospice because she was in a hospice home, a four bed home. So, but they could go on the phone you know, talk to you on the phone. And, and she chose not to talk with the spiritual advisors, you know, during her time at hospice, at least the time where she could talk, et cetera. But um, so it is important, whatever faith you have and whatever your definition of that faith is, that your belief in that, okay, and your faith in that could absolutely for sure help you in the journey it helped me in my journey in, in what I, in my relationship with Gail, 
even though we didn't see exactly, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't treat it the same way, but uh, we had an appreciation for it. Absolutely. So where can people find 126 days and 11 minutes? Um, the best way is on Amazon. There's a Kindle version. Um, there's the paperback version, 126 days, 11 minutes. So you just go our love story. If you go to Amazon book, if you, if you do, and, and I'm honored, if you go and invest in the book, um, please submit a review of it. Uh, I've been blessed with many, many kind and thoughtful and very, very respectful. And, um, I'm very humble by, by some of the reviews that have come through on it. Um, I will say it's a quick read. I think anybody it, it's, it's 340 pages, but it reads like about 200 pages. Um, every chapter is a day. And I think you will find um, once you start getting into it, it flows uh, very well. Um, I will have the audio version out this year. Uh, and that would be on Amazon's Audible uh, option. And um, so, but right now, th that's the best way uh, to get it. Yeah. Okay. And is there any con contact information that you would like to have if anybody wanted to get in, in touch with you about you know, you know coaching, coaching or anything yeah, you're, that you're into the easiest way. Thank you, Melanie, for, for, for offering that. Um, the easiest way is, um, if you want to, um, meet me on Facebook at Larry and uh, if you want to over at LinkedIn, I'm also at Larry and over on LinkedIn. Okay. So LinkedIn or Facebook, very easily done. If you want to DM me on Facebook, that's, that's great. I'll, I'll certainly, uh, do that. If you want to email me, I'll just put this out to it's L Indiviglia at gmail.com. So I know that's a mouthful, but L I N D I V I G L I A at gmail.com. I will, I answer all my email and, um, the book is it. I don't have a coaching program, uh, surrounding the book or about the book. Um, I think, um, there's, there's been some inquiries and I'll, I'm not going to really mention them <laughs> about a, a movie, uh, uh, a movie possibility, but um, uh, a discussion on that would be premature at this point. But there's been a couple of discussions I've had. Uh -huh. But right now, the book is it, and uh, I do believe that you'll get value. And if anything, um, you'll learn about a woman whose life made a difference, not only to me. Uh, but to everybody she touched and anything she, she did. Um, and I, I believe that, um, anybody who does read the book, you'll get some value and a lesson from Gail's life and, and what I shared in our relationship, because you'll learn about her and she's not here to tell her story. It's not a, an autobiography about Gail, but you'll learn a lot more about Gail, the woman, and also somebody who was, um, battling a disease that continues to be a challenge challenge for so many women and so many people so yeah uh, i believe that i learned a lot about myself as well as i was reading that and some of the beliefs that i'm like hmm, do i hold those same beliefs or could i do that so i found it uh, rather refreshing and rather fascinating so i will link your email address down at the bottom in the description so feel free to check that out Larry, it's been a pleasure today. Thank you so much for joining me. Melanie, thank you for inviting me. It's been a great connection. And thank you for all the work you're doing to inspire people, to coach people. Your uh, Together We Box program that you're doing with Mackenzie, your daughter, just so inspiring. And um, uh, it's, it, you know, it's one person at a time. And that's that next connection that, you know, it's almost like in a great basketball team, the pass that leads to the pass that leads to the basket. It's never, it's always a team and, and, and a community type way that we have the most impact in life. And you're certainly doing that. So thank you so much. Thank you, Larry. Yeah, thank you. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. All right. So thank you guys for tuning in and I look forward to seeing you back here next week. I am so excited. We have, we've just been making global connections around the world. So excited to bring you back in next week. You're going to love our next guests. 
Until then, make it a fantastic day. We'll see you next week.